Hello, and welcome on this webinar on the unsung heroes of additive manufacturing. In additive manufacturing, we typically think of complex parts. Parts that cannot cr be created in any other way. Parts that create added value through its complexity. We cannot deny that that makes sense. But that's not the full story. Parts in additive manufacturing can add value also with a lot less complexity. These parts are often put less into the spotlights. And that's what we want to do in this upcoming webinar. Hi, I'm Erik de Zeeuw. I'm a market manager at Materialize. And I'm sitting here with Mathieu Cornelis from our business advisory division called Mindware. Mathieu, can you quickly uh, tell the audience what Mindware does? Absolutely, Erik. Thanks for the introduction. Materialize Mindware is an advisory service, as you just explained. And actually, we are in contact with a wide range of different customers and different un industries on their onboarding trajectory of additive manufacturing. And as you know, it's a challenge. It's not an easy ride. And we actually give them support in that onboarding from A to Z. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, um, I'll start by setting the scene in this webinar with an example. I'm working on the cross-section of two disciplines on one hand, 3D printing, of course, and on the other hand, aerospace. In aerospace, additive is starting to be used more and more, and we see some very nice examples. But these examples are often very complex parts, like this one, for instance. Parts that, through their design, create a lot of value, in that sense that they are lighter and that they can save weight uh, when an airplane is flying. These are often the examples that you see the most, like the one that are flashing by uh, on the screen. The issue with this is that these parts need a lot of effort to get qualified. One needs a lot of rigor and process control to certify such part. So what we see in the adoption of additive manufacturing in aerospace nowadays is that we start on a step-by-step -step approach starting with simpler parts. Parts that create value, not because they are so complex, but because they have additional benefits. This is an example from our aerospace, which is basically pushed through the, the difficult qualification of parts in additive manufacturing. But Mathieu, do you observe such things as well in other industries? Absolutely. We, um, as I said, we are in touch with a wide variety uh, of industries going from wearables to industrial goods, uh, consumer products in, in, in general. And definitely there, of course, everybody talks about the very complex and nice examples. That's nice to tell and it's easy to showcase, of course. Um, but we see that a lot of customers also see the value and start to discover the value within those um, simple parts, those unsung parts, as you explained it, um, parts which aren't directly clear on what the value of additive is from first uh, side on. And it's very easy to explain by uh, the two examples that uh, the viewers will now see. Um, the one is actually on your left side is a very um, complex part. It's very straightforward and it's interesting for additive because of the lattice structure and the complex structure. On the right, the uh, viewers, they see the very simple component, a straightforward part. Um, and if we would ask um, the people watching what is the most suitable part for additive, everybody would go to the left because of those obvious reasons. Um, it's also what we see with customers. They start looking for those complex parts um, unproducible in any other way. And that's what they see as the uh, yeah, the most interesting parts for them to look for. If we then compare it to the uh, business case behind the parts, we actually see that uh, the right part is most valuable and most interesting to look at. And the truth lies underneath what you see on the outside. It's actually a uh, very uh, straightforward, complex part, but of course, um, the right one, the business case, it's much more interesting because of those um, different parameters to look at. And in first reflection, everybody looks at um, technical complexities. Um, but of course, there is difference between technical complexity and supply chain complexities. And 
these days companies they do see disruptions with supply chains um, think on the Suez Canal things on the COVID situation of course um, and they start to look for alternatives alternatives for conventional technologies where they then look into additive of course and additive can then bring value um, by supplying it close by uh, producing it locally and to cope with all the difficulties that we have seen in the last couple of years passing by of course um, it's a clear cutoff between uh, the two big um, uh, clusters of technical parameters and economical parameters. Um, to run over a few, and we will um, hand out um, the complete overview to uh, the viewers. Um, actually, on your left, you have those obvious ones, the uh, technical parameters like complexity, like um, it's unproducible, it's um, interesting because I can combine components uh, and so on. Um, on your right, you have those economical parameters, the parameters, as said earlier, who are hidden, who are not that obvious. Um, to name a few, it's like uh, a minimum order quantity. Um, not all companies um, are aware directly of, uh, for example, startup costs or um, transportation costs or storage costs. Um, and that, are, of course, are parameters who are important in the selection of uh, the right uh, parts for additive. Before it was impossible to make, it's perfect for additive. Now it is actually a very simple, straightforward component, but due to the fact that it's impossible to get the part here on time, can already be a driver, uh, and that was actually a little bit uh, unseen before, uh, and that's what a trend that we see in uh, many different cases and many different industries, of course. Can you maybe elaborate uh, on those uh, drivers a bit more? Definitely, if you if you talk about um, minimum order quantities, it's it's a very obvious one. Um, if you start to order a part, if you want to order a part, um, of course you have the minimum quantity that you need to purchase. And uh, with conventional technology, is often connected to uh, your mold, your investment of your mold. So you need to have uh, x amount of parts before a company even start producing it. With additive, the nice thing is that we can simply make one part or a few parts. Um, there is no difference in actually the startup of uh, one component or 10 components, it doesn't matter. Um, so I said that it's, it's a different way of looking at components and it's actually often a comparison with conventional technologies to actually clarify uh, if, it, uh, if a part is suitable or not. It's often a, uh, a comparison, a balance uh, that is calculated. All right, and what else? Um, besides MOQ, and often uh, something that is taken into uh, account is a startup cost. Um, if you normally have a startup cost of, uh, let's say, two to 3,000 euros for a mold, um, it's often neglected in the calculation of your complete cost uh, spectrum uh, because uh, a lot of companies just compare prices one to one. And of course, if you compare prices one to one, we see and we are all, uh, obvious, uh, honest in that, that AM often is more uh, expensive. But imagine that you only need two components and you have a startup cost of uh, five to 10,000 euros. Of course, you need to calculate that cost within your part cost as well. And that gives, of course, a big uh, difference in your calculation of uh, the so-called uh, TCO or total cost of ownership of your component. So yeah, it's uh, something that we uh, that we often uh, see passing by. Um, of course, it's not always a black and white story. It's obviously something that you see in aerospace applications as well, I, uh, I assume. Indeed, uh, most definitely. Um, so um, parts are chosen not always only of their technical complexity or only of their supply chain complexity. Um, and uh, we see that we introduce some bits of complexity where we can. Um, it is noted that most, the majority of our parts are uh, having uh, a limited amount of technical complexity uh, and that most are chosen because of their supply chain complexity. But um, often we need to do little changes to make them printable. Uh, we need to uh, design for the specificities of those AM uh, machines sometimes. So that's a degree of complexity that we need to introduce. And uh, one should definitely not scare away uh, from complexity when it is possible because it will introduce or it will improve your business case. If we take a look at the graph, when you see where additive makes most sense, it is 
the section where you have low quantity typically or medium quantity. You have no setup cost in additive, so that means that uh, for the low threshold of parts or the low quantity of parts, your business case is typically better than the conventional technologies. Uh, with tooling, you always have an investment cost and your part price is typically lower. So there is at a certain time, there is a tipping point where one technology gets better than the other. Um, this tipping point typically lies between five and 50,000 parts. That value depends on the size of the parts, the complexity of the part, uh, and a lot of other drivers. What we observe is that when you bring in complexity, you can move this tipping point. Your setup cost or your tool cost gets more expensive, so you start at a higher point. Uh, and uh, yeah, the cross section will be further down the road, which means that you could have a better business case for your product. You see in the interlay that there is a technical complex part, but uh, the, the audience should note that it's not only technical complexity, but also supply chain complexity that can improve your business case. Eric, with your uh, experience in certified manufacturing, do you see a big influence in that technical complexity in the certification process of parts? When certifying an end-use part, one needs to go to an industrialization process called PPAP. And PPAP is the short for? I can tell you what it's not. It's not pen, pineapple, apple pen. PPAP stands for Product and Part Approval Process. So it's a methodology um, developed in the automotive sector, but which is gaining ground in other industries as well. If we take the example of what you have on your nose, uh, you have 3D printed eyewear on your nose. There's one on the table here as well. If you compare both, uh, this one looks a lot more complex than uh, the one that you are wearing. But if we look at the elements of the PIPA process, uh, which are shown on screen, you can see there are 18 components in the methodology or uh, documentation that you need to provide uh, to make sure that your component is properly industrialized. For eyewear, for those two products that we see on your nose and here, um, this um, is very much the same. You will not have a big difference in how you assess the quality on how you uh, create the design or things that you need to take into account for your design. So there is not a big variation in that part approval process. If we take the example of a higher critical and complex part in aerospace, like this one, for instance, and we take uh, a simpler one, like this one, we see that the part approval process is very different. For instance, in this case, with those lattice structures, it will highly impact the element called DFMEA. It's the design risk register where you need to assess all the uh, elements in your design and how this could impact the outcome of your product. With those lattices, you need to assess how this could possibly impact the dynamic behavior. Yeah? How long will they last? This is something that's very tricky. The same in your product, in your process, in your printing process, which you need to control to your PFMEA. Creating lattices that are as strong as you would normally print, that is also not sure. You need to, um, yeah. What we typically do is we print coupons huh? and we test those coupons, but how are you going to relate the strength of those coupons to what you have printed in those lattices? Uh, so this is a very tough question to answer and introducing such kind of complexity in your product uh, doesn't come for free in aerospace. So this is an example of how the industrialization process fo should follow the same methodology, but the depth of which can be totally different depending on the segment where you want to introduce your complexity. All right, Eric, do you, do you also have like uh, simpler parts than the one that you actually just explained? Because I see this part here. One? Yeah, this one is a, a good example, I believe. Yeah, this is an example from a customer called uh, 328. And uh, of course, uh, you can see that uh, if you compare those two parts, that this has far less complexity. Uh, it's a straightforward, or maybe not straightforward, but it's a conventional uh, plastic design. Um, and, uh, well, there is less technical complexity in this product, and it is also a less critical application. And so uh, this is far easier to industrialize. Uh, and these are the 
unsung hero examples that we come across on a daily basis, yeah. at least in aerospace. Do you have examples from uh, your end? I explained it already um, in, in, a, in a theoretical way, of course, but a, a good example to, um, to connect to that is, is what we've done with, with CNH. Uh, CNH is an agricultural player. They make uh, harvesting machines, big harvesting machines. Um, and at a certain point, they actually had a, a supply chain issue. Um, they couldn't deliver one specific component for their entire assembly. Um, it's also very straightforward, like this one. Uh, very straightforward design. Uh, conventionally, actually, if we're honest, it can be conventionally made. Um, but there, it was definitely the trade-off on supply chain level as the part would um, block the entire assembly line, which made uh, an, uh, a huge investment or a, a huge um, penalty fee of not delivering uh, the components, uh, the, the machines uh, to their uh, customers. Uh, and of course, they went on with an AM solution, um, an AM solution which is more expensive at first sight on part level, as just explained, often the part level is slightly higher, of course, but on the overall picture, they could deliver uh, the machines uh, on time. And that's, of course, a, a huge benefit because otherwise they, first of all, had um, an assembly line which was entirely stopped, so not good for the, the company itself, but also their customers wouldn't be happy, of course, if they hadn't got uh, the machines in place or their products in place in the right time. Does that answer your question? Is uh, partially, I'm still wondering how do you got to those case, basically. Um, yeah, as indicated in the beginning on, and you gave a great introduction as well, um, we um, actually deliver an advisory service where we guide customers in their onboarding. And in that exploration of finding the right application is one big element of our so-called triple E model. You have exploration, you have experiment and the enable phase. The exploration is, of course, the first phase where we look into finding the right applications, the one that matter. And the two uh, sets of drivers that we just ran over is actually a model, a methodology that we use internally ourselves. We don't look only for those technical interesting components. Of course, we look into those because it simply makes sense. But we also search for those um, supply chain driven uh, parts and those economically interesting components. And out of such an exercise, typically parts um, that are slightly more easier to produce, uh, like uh, the CNH example, they pop up because um, it's uh, less straightforward from an AM point of view to directly grab such a part, but if you look into the business case and what lies behind it, you actually get a, a nice case in front of you which can um, give a great benefit and a huge benefit for the company. Uh, so that's a great exploration there. How can our audience uh, go forth with this? As said, we uh, will not leave them without any additional information afterwards. So um, they first of all get a list of, of course, those technical drivers and those economical drivers. We will send the information on how to onboard additive manufacturing. It's something that we will provide as well. Um, so it's great to have a, a read through there. And of course, they can reach out if they have any additional questions or they want to uh, explore together with us what AM uh, can mean within their organization. And of course, when reading through and when looking on those parameters, uh, hopefully some unsung heroes pop up already um, because we truly believe that um, every company will have uh, a few of them at least that lay around and where AM can bring uh, uh, some value to them. That sounds like a nice goal. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. And I think with this, uh, we have unfolded you the story of our unsung heroes and we can wrap up this webinar. Thank you for your attention and we'll be available for your questions. Mm -hmm.